Hi, I'm Diane Hullett, and welcome to the Best Life, Best Death podcast. I'm here today with a really interesting guest, Brother James Patrick Hall. Hi, JP. Hi there. How are you? Good, good. And James and I met, James Patrick, also going by JP, we met at a film showing in Boulder, and we got to talking afterwards. And I thought the work that he did was really, really interesting, and he said, well, I'd love to be on a podcast. So here we are. Um, JP works for the Rocky Mountain Refuge for End of Life Care. And I tell us, tell us what that is, what its mission is. So Rocky Mountain Refuge for End of Life Care is a specialized shelter to enables unhoused people to receive hospice care. Hospices are not shelters. They struggle to take care of someone who is on the street who needs hospice care. Medicare only gives you five days of inpatient care if you're on hospice, and that's designed for symptom management, not for long-term care. Shelters are not designed for this. Our shelters here in town are designed for near-term needs. They're not designed for the long-term support that a hospice patient will need. So we're a specialized shelter that fits that gap in care. We're the only one in Colorado who do this. And there's only one of four in the United States that we are aware of that does this. Wow, one of four in the US. And when I think of the number of unhoused folks, um, you know, the people who are on the streets, that that's just seems so remarkably under underconnected for what the need must be. Most people think this is being taken care of somewhere. The people who know about this are shelters, hospitals, and hospices. Uh, but, but most people just think it's being taken care of. The rate of homelessness in this country or in Denver um, is growing. And over the past uh, five years, the city of Denver and uh, other partner organizations have said that it's increased between 80 to 90% in the last five years. Another key point is that when a person is unhoused, their life expectancy drops by 30 years. Wow. We, we see this. Most of our residents are between the age of 50 and 59. Wow, that is shocking, isn't it? How, how did this get started? How did the Rocky Mountain Refuge become established? So about five years ago, a friend of mine was doing some chaplaincy work at a local uh, medical facility. She uh, became aware of a person in a, in a hospital room by themselves, just a dark hospital room with nothing going on there, but some beeping machines. And she investigated what's the deal with this person and discovered that this was an unhoused person that was actively dying. And she went in and um, held his hand and prayed with him that night as he passed away. And she uh, got a hold of me the next day and, and asked me, where do homeless people die? And I said, they die where they live, under, under bridges, on, on streets, um, you know, uh, according to our, our data that we've collected, uh, about 25% uh, uh, are in hospitals. Uh, that's terribly expensive for the community and for them and often uncomfortable. Um, there's about 14% that, that uh, are in hotels or motels, <clears throat> which is one thing that hospices do try to do. They'll rent a hotel room, but a person can't really be taking, you know, if you're on hospice, you can't take care of yourself. And a lot of times these folks die alone because um, no one's there with them. And then uh, the rest of them die on the street. Wow, those are tremendous, tremendous statistics. So, so she sort of saw this need. Well, she, she asked me about it. And then I told her about the, the concept of a social model hospice house. A social model hospice house is built on the... Uh, uh, Catholic Church's response to the AIDS crisis in the 80s. Uh, they made these houses where people could be taken care of who were dying that their families would not take care of them and hospitals didn't want them. And there was nowhere else for them to go. There was a large number of young men at the time. And, but fortunately, that, that's gone away. But the idea of this 
hospice house stayed around and now it's a nationwide organization uh, where, which we're a part of and there's about I think it's about 70 of them nationwide but the vast majority it's not really intentionally this way but the vast majority end up with middle class folks housed middle class folks uh, there's only four of us that are um, directly for the unhoused the others will take an unhoused person from time to time but that's not their focus it is our focus incredible how, how did you personally get into this work so i first got involved with hospice when one of my favorite uncles when i was um many years ago when i was kind of a kid in college he he got on hospice and um my family was just so impressed with the hospice nurses and stuff who assisted him and um that was my first experience with it. And then some years later, when my younger brother was, was ill and on hospice, our parish in Oklahoma, a lady at our parish in Oklahoma started uh, a hospice house in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where I lived. And I was a volunteer there. And so I saw what could be done. So when my friend asked me about it, I knew what the answer was and told yeah. her about it and then she said that's great that's what we need to do and i said okay number one you're crazy number two it's impossible number three when do you want to start meeting <laughs> number four how are we going to get a money to support this right because exactly I, is this i assume this is a nonprofit. i mean it, it is a nonprofit. we started about five years ago uh it is a nonprofit. we um um we opened earlier this year for our, our pilot project and we we spent this year learning a lot of stuff. Uh, we've learned more about uh, costs. We've learned more about procedures. We've learned more about individuals. Uh, we've learned about staffing. And so now we have we've we've learned enough this year that now we can really sort of really start for next year. Uh, we we know we've yeah, got yeah we've you kind of had real, to figure it. Yes, you had we to had, figure it out. Yeah, well, it's like a ship in a rudder. The rudder doesn't move. It doesn't direct you until you start moving. We had to start to to start. So uh, now we have better, we know what the challenges and the needs are, um, and we, we get better, better uh, handle on that. Yeah, better know what the staffing needs are and so on. What, what are the challenges facing, you know, those who have no home and are dying? I mean, I can think of several, but how, how do you articulate those challenges? Well, first of all, you don't have a comfortable place to stay. Um, we, we keep people clean, dry, fed. In a nice bed, um, there's a bathroom. I mean, you know, we take care of it just like in a home. We replace the home and the family because we do custodial family style care. So for the person who's seeking care, who is unhoused, um, one of the things is that some of the pain medications that are normally used in hospice care, um, you can't uh, function very well on them. So you can't keep track of your, did I take this? Or I mean, it. You know, and the older I get, the the harder it is to keep track of what pills I take. So, you know, it's it's um, definitely um, a challenge for them. Other times, their their pain pills are stolen, or or um, um, uh, they they don't know what they're doing and they take too many at once and, and then they're gone. Uh, we have had various uh, residents. Uh, we and we call them residents because this is their home while they're with us. Um, We've had various residents report that they they go to hospitals, they get pain management, they they get you know they get um, admitted to a hospital, they get pain management taken care of, they get discharged with medication, the medication is stolen, it's it's not used properly, they, it's lost, or sometimes you know uh, there's times when probably some of them have sold some of it, but uh, for but uh, that's probably the least amount because. A lot of our folks are in terrible pain and and that's usually they don't care about the money by this time. Um, well, that's I was thinking about just the challenge of pain management. If you're in a home and you have family and you have hospice coming three days a week, it's it. That's a challenge to manage pain. And that's with people, as you said, helping you say, hey, you've got to take your pill every six hours or every eight hours. Exactly. Um, 
So how could you possibly manage that on your own living on the street in some way? So I can imagine there's these cycles of spiking pain that just yes. cause more trouble. And all of this leads to emergency room visits, right? Yes, Which again, are just terribly expensive and don't really you've solve got the, the problem. Exactly. You've got the fire department, you've got the ambulance, you've got the uh, emergency room, you've got if they admit into the hospital, you've got all of these costs, which, um, and, and we have a certain resident that we discussed this with with her and, and went through all this. Uh, another thing is, is you can't take care if, if you if you have uh, some of our, our people have had spouses or pets on the street, you can't take care of your loved ones, because uh, you can't take care of yourself. Uh, you can't, there's nowhere for the hospice to come to give you the medicine. So they have to find places to meet. That's why they sometimes rent hotel rooms. Uh, we had a gentleman who was in a hotel room that um, uh, we took him from the hotel room to our facility. He had a garbage bag full of medicine bottles. The hospice nurse, our, our doctor, and I went through all these medicine bottles. It turned out he only needed four of them. And all these other things were just confusing him and stuff. And they were, it was, it was, it was a big waste because he didn't know what he could keep. He had stuff from years ago and, and things that he was carrying around of in a bag. Course. Of course. He's trying oh my to take gosh. care. He's trying to do his care. Where where do how do most people hear about the refuge? Uh, that's, that's something that, uh, we're trying to get the word out. Um, hospitals are starting to know about us. Hospices, we have various hospice organizations. The hospices aren't, um, they're are vital to our work, but which particular hospice it is, isn't important. We have partnerships with, with Denver Hospice, True Community Care Hospice. There are two big, uh, early supporters. We have partnerships with uh, Elevation Hospice, Lutheran Hospice, Namaste Hospice. Uh, one of our newest hospices uh, partners is um, uh, Complete Complete Care Colorado. Um, uh, we just, if, if someone's on a different hospice organization, we work out a relationship with them. And that's primarily just so they know what we provide. And we, you know, it's just so we all know what everybody's doing. It's pretty easy but to I'm do. I imagine a lot of times it's someone who comes into the ER with symptoms and then there's a realization that they're at the end. I mean, well, uh, we had know, a resident really recently, just exactly like that. She came into the ER, she had symptoms. She was um, uh, 59, I believe. Um, she had a, uh, um, uh, whatever her, I can't remember her specific disease. She was not on hospice. So the hospital calls us, hospital social worker calls us, and we connect her with a hospice. They come in and do their their stuff because to come into our facility, you have to be on hospice and you have to be have a DNR, which is a do not resuscitate. Because if you want to be resuscitated in full code, we can't do that. We're just a family situation. So we you have to be a DNR uh, in our facility. Also, you have to be unhoused or housing insecure. And that means it's it's not necessarily safe for you to be home alone or how in, many, in your condition. Right, in your condition. How many um, beds do you hope to have in this coming year? Four. We'd like to, we have two now. We'd like to double that to four. And I can uh, imagine they would be full all the time. Well, as, as the rate of our inquiries has gone up, uh, we, we started out, we had some blank spots where we didn't have anybody there for a while. It'd, it'd be a week or so and then we'd get somebody and stuff. But as now people are getting to hear about us and starting to work, uh, we're now getting uh, people where like right now we have, uh, we have one resident, one's coming in on Monday uh, and then we have two or three on our waiting list. Wow. Wow. I, I'm struck by the range of needs because as, as you said, it's really the basic clean and dry. I mean, that's so basic when you're ill and dying. And then the palliative care of medicine. And then, like you said, this complexity of pets, spouses, friends. I mean, it's, you, you just, you get your head around it. If you're a person with a house or an apartment or a roof over your head, and you think, how would you manage all of that if you were on the street? It's just so much. What, what have you come up with for the pet aspect? Because I know that's, that is an issue. 
one of the oftentimes one of the most important relationships an unhoused person can have is with their pet generally the dog but not always and uh, i have seen with myself where people won't go into a shelter in bad weather because the shelter won't allow the dog in and they will stay out to protect the dog out in the in the cold um we understand this uh, while we can't have, we rent these rooms from Denver Rescue Mission, we have to go by the rules and we can't have non, um, um, we can't have just pets in there. But what we do have is we have a relationship with Max Fund No Kill Shelter and they, we have a relationship with them and they will take the pet. It hasn't happened yet, but it will. Uh, they'll take the pet. They'll ensure that the pet is never killed. It will be taken care of. Uh, and hopefully adopted out uh, while the uh, owner is still with us. Uh, they're going to bring a picture of the pet out. And so they have it. And then they, uh, we might work out ways that the pet can visit and stuff uh, yeah. during, yeah. during the person's. Yeah. But, but the idea is, is that how can you relax and die in comfort? If you know that your dear fur baby is, is out there on the street somewhere. So or, or is going to be picked up and, yes. and taken to a kill shelter and just right. assumed to be a problem dog. I, I remember reading that some of the dogs that live, um, you know, with unhoused people are some of actually the most socialized animals because they're very used to a pack hierarchy and a lot of people and a lot of other dogs. I thought that was really interesting. That is, they're, that is interesting. They're, they're pack, they're pack animals and they, right. they know their, their, they know their place. Well, you know, how can people support your work? I mean, it just sounds like a tremendous effort. This kind of care isn't cheap. Uh, it, it costs us, you know, we've, we've got, um, uh, we have to hire round the clock staff. We, we have uh, weekends, holidays, this is overtime pay, all of this stuff. It, it costs more. Um, and we, we, um, we want to expand our services next year. We want to go into the room next to us. We want to, um, the this is an old motel that we're renting. These rooms are an old motel. So those bathrooms are 1950s bathrooms. We want to rebuild those into ADA compliant bathrooms. Um, the two rooms we have now, there there's a linked door. We want to put a door into the a third room over here and go in that room. And yeah, we have we have lots of plans, but this this isn't cheap. Um, uh, it it's going to cost us around uh, four hundred fifty thousand dollars a year to provide this care. But in comparison to what it costs the hospitals, the taxpayers, and the community, it it is cheap. Um, so to help us, uh, there's a couple of ways you can help us. You can go to our website, which is rockymountainrefuge.org, all one word, uh, Rocky Mountain Refuge, one word, and there's a donate tab on there, and you can just go right there and donate. Uh, we do have a GoFundMe page. Uh, I don't really know which is for a, a, a current little uh, fundraising we're doing right now. I'm not sure how to probably share Probably if you, well, probably if you go to GoFundMe and then put in Rocky Mountain Refuge, I bet it arrives. Uh, probably. That's yeah. what I, I have. I've never done it that way, but that's probably, that's just a temporary uh, fundraising deal. The main thing we use is the donate tab on our uh, website. Now, one thing that is very helpful to us is that if you become a monthly donor, even if it's a small amount, that regularizes our budget so that we know what's coming in all the time and that we can we can have a more stable budget. And that's tremendous. on the, well, you click the donate button and it takes you right to that. Tremendous. I, it sounds like I mean, you both have sort of, um, you will ultimately have kind of physical building needs as well as just ongoing cost needs. What, eventually, what happens, go ahead. Eventually, uh, we, we, we have talked with shelters in Colorado Springs and Boulder. Uh, we, want to, we want to sort of <laughs> franchise this model in a way to where we can do it from, you know, the, all across the front raids, the western slope, just wherever. We currently, anyone in Colorado will accept. If you can get them to us and they meet our criteria and everything, we'll, we'll take anybody in Colorado. 
Well, I think it's interesting because you're 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 offering a, a, a respite place. You're offering a place of literally what your name says, a refuge. And and then part of your challenge is supporting that financially. And then the other part of it is letting people know it's there right. and getting people to trust that and to come to that and to see it as this softer landing for an ending. One of the things that's happening with um, uh, national, the national conversation on health care for homeless people is respite care. Uh, Colorado Coalition for the Homeless is opening a big respite facility in Denver uh, this week, I think. But that is for people who will be getting better. That's not for chronic, uh, like, uh, you know, chronic illnesses or hospice. That's for, you know, that's, that's designed for people who will like recover from surgery or something. But um, this right. kind of, this, right. this specific niche is, is, is tough. About 21% of the, of the um, uh, 270 or so people who died last year on the streets in Denver, about 21% of them, which is about 56 people, uh, died of quote unquote natural causes. Uh, this is, again, with the 30 year lifespan being reduced and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, these folks, many, many of these could have used hospice care. Yeah. Yeah, natural causes means that it wasn't an overdose. It wasn't an accident of some kind. Their body were. stopped working, but why did their body stop working and how and, difficult was that? Right. And a lot of times it was alone, afraid, and in unmanaged pain. That's yeah. a tough way to go. It's interesting that I think a lot of people feel that their number one or a number one concern about fear of death is, is pain. It so is. it's powerful that a huge number of people who don't have access, good access to medicine or palliative care, hospice care, that that is going to be a reality for them. That's really harsh. It, it really is harsh. And there we have uh, our hospice partners uh, can keep people comfortable and relaxed uh, during their last times. We've had uh, it's. I know it's kind of funny for people to understand this, but we've had some very beautiful passings um, uh, with people with with that have been with us. Well, I can imagine there must be just a, a, a an outbreath of relief at feeling like I'm warm. I'm in a clean bed. I, I can I can die knowing I'm cared for. That's just so different than I'm in a tent in a rainstorm on a street with chaos. That's an interesting point, because one of the things we've noticed is that several of our residents, probably a majority, when they come to us, they just sort of relax and then die within a week or so. They just so you can see them relax over the first day or so. They feel safe. They know they're going to be taken care of and they just relax and let go and let it happen. Yeah. Yeah, I can imagine they they just sort of cross into that with a with a with an outbreath, you know, literally instead of that kind of tension and fear of when will this happen and how will it happen. Right. What what tremendous work you're doing, JP? What what else would you say? You know, it's an honor to be with many of our folks when they pass. They they have um, uh, we've had people that have they're very kind. We had a, a guy that came in that was, he was 50 years old, but you would swear he was 35. Uh, just uh, amazing person. He was uh, full of laughter and, and stuff. And he was, uh, he, was uh, he was a double amputee, but he was uh, sort of in, in bed dancing. He was kind of dancing with our, our, our caregiver ladies and, and just having a great time. And, and he just, he said he was so happy to be there. And the next morning he was gone. Wow. just that quick um you know and others have uh, they've expressed the happiness of being there um some uh when they get there they're a little confused uh, we've had some older people with some dementia um you know that's a little more difficult for them sometimes to understand what where they are and what's happening and stuff but most of our folks just are really happy to have a place where they can just relax and, and let someone else take care of them 
Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. And 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 this seems like a terrible question, but but I, I really ask it out of information. What what happens to someone's body when they die in this state? Is it are they cremated? Are they buried? Does the city have a the city of Denver we're talking about have a way to handle the unhoused? Yes. With no the, family, presumably? Yes, there's there's a, a, a there's an office we have a relationship with them. There's an office that takes care of that. Typically, what happens is that um, uh, when a person passes, we call the hospice, and they come out and um, um, you know check them, and then they call the coroner's office, and they, everything gets all taken care of. And then we, but we already have a mortuary picked out, and the mortuary comes picks up the body, and then the city. Uh, most, the vast majority of them are cremated. The city pays the mortuary a certain amount to, to cremate a person, and then the remains are given to their next of kin. Um, the um, um, uh, occasionally people want to be buried. There's a uh, a recent resident who um, wanted to be buried at the Catholic cemetery. And so we arranged that with the archdiocese. And, um, you know, there's a, another person who was interested, although um, they changed their mind at the end and, and shifted over to cremation. At first, they were uh, looking into a green funeral uh, up, the, up the slope a little bit. So uh, whatever yeah. the, res yeah. we call ourselves resident driven. Uh, we don't care who or what you are. We don't care about your religion, your gender, your gender identity, your uh, your orientation. Any, any, none of that matters. Uh, we just want to take care of folks at the end of their life and whatever they want, because they've had a lot of trauma in their life. Whatever they want, we want to do. So we call ourselves resident driven. So whatever uh, religious stuff or, or not, whatever um, uh to do with their body or not we try we try to accommodate whatever we can well jp i just think this is such tremendous work and um you've had some wonderful press you've had some great articles written about you and i hope that that's inspiring people in denver and colorado to learn more um and i just really appreciate all you've brought to our conversation today thank you remember our website rockymountainrefuge.org all one word Beautiful. Well, thanks again, JP. Thank and you, you can for find your time. out about Yeah, you can find out more about the work I do at bestlifebestdeath.com. And I just encourage all of us to think about all the range of how death comes to different people and what we can do to support others. Exactly. Thanks so much, JP. Thank Have you. a great day. Bye-bye.